what? Who's missing? I see how Who's missing? Wait, is somebody missing? Wait, I no, think Jamak? producer Mike is AWOL. When the producer's <laughs> away, the crew will play. <laughs> what did right you, now, what did they're you just all naked. <laughs> oh, AWOL, you said. AWOL, oh, yes. Oh, okay. Oh, thought, you, you misunderstood me. I thought you said something else. I need to enunciate better. Here's the thing. Somehow Mike thinks that the show will not be done correctly because he's not, he's not here. Not, not, true. True. not true. Not true. There's cameras. So, no. There's people. Huh? I bet he's in the chat room right now. Is Mike in the chat room right now? Is he? Yes. Whoa! Oh, what's he saying right now? You're fired? Did you just fire me? Because I said that? I made fun of him? You are fired. I'm fire you from Austin. Huh? You're good. He's, on, he's in the chat room. You're being fired out of a cannon. I don't know what that means. <laughs> there we go. I don't get it. Uh, Mark Heiser? Wade Major. Now, uh, Wade and I uh, also do a podcast, DVD podcast, called The Digigods. Digigods.com? Which, uh, yes, it's on IGN.com. By the mm -hmm. way, IGN is owned by News Corp, which yes, it also is. owns Fox. But I'm it's okay with that. It's very attenuated. Uh, so, but we don't work for Fox. No. We don't work for Fox News. Well, you never we know. Just... We may get that call from Murdoch one of these days. Oh, God, please call me. <laughs> I can use the money. Uh, <laughs> so here's the thing. We'll be talking about uh, 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 Battle LA Yes, we on. will. We'll be talking about uh, a super sneak, super duper preview. It's kind of an alien show today. And that's not to reflect poorly on the crew. Has nothing to do with the crew. Hey. This is I, Battle Los Angeles or Battle LA. We we have to discuss what the real title is because it's a little foggy, right? Very true. But and we have a super duper, super duper sneak, sneak preview. First time anywhere we will be hearing about Paul. It's an alien themed Ooh. show. Alien themed today. Ooh. Ooh. Before we get to that, yeah. let me just say something. Uh, now we have a crew here. These guys they work their butt off. And, you know, it's the internet. I want to say the A word, but I want to, I'll say but, because I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe <laughs> Philip Nelson's kids are watching and they'll be offended. I don't know what goes on. What do I know? And I have to say that they go above and beyond. Now, uh, we have a uh, uh, very um, valued member of the staff here who made this Stupid for Movies poster. Now, would you like me, Corey, to go on this camera for it? How about this camera? Whoa, very look nice. at that! Now, uh, Jim did this, and I have to say... I am very impressed, and what impressed me originally about this uh, is the fact that he spelled my name two different ways <laughs> when he originally designed awesome. this poster, and it was hanging on the wall of the streaming garage, and I said, God, Jim, that's just awesome, and you know what? Please spell my name the correctly. You know, it's like my name is spelled one way here, and then two inches down, it's spelled another way. How does that happen? I mean, that's the, Magic. Kind of, that's the kind of detail that will make Jim a very successful TV producer, I have to tell you. <laughs> probably, of reality, probably of reality television. Who are all the so, in that picture, well, look, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, Paul F. Tompkins. Ooh, we have uh, Mike I'm in uh, South by Southwest trying to get the crew their well-deserved money, Rotman. Yeah. We have uh, this guy, uh, and then we have uh, this idiot. Yeah. That's what we got. <laughs> so uh, I am going to take this, and I'm going to frame it. I kid you not. Good for you, Jim. Jim did a very good job. Very nice. Thank you, Jim. Well done. Well done. All right, so uh, uh, we've uh, given props to the uh, crew. Mm -hmm. That means there's only one thing left to do, Wade. This weekend in movies! <laughs> that was a... Okay. <laughs> yes, keep applauding! Come on, wait. Oh, you know, if you want to applaud for yourself, Wade, who will applaud for you? Everyone. <laughs> Everyone. Now, uh, you know, it's funny, we were, uh, Wade had alluded to uh, Battle L.A. Yes. Now, uh, Wade, explain to the good folks why there's a weird disconnect in the title. Like, somehow, the studio couldn't get it together with even the title. Somehow, look, we're all accustomed to the, the weird little letter and, numer uh, the, the, the letter and number abbreviations we've gotten on movies ever since Terminator 2, which was nicknamed T2, and then Independence Day was ID4, right? And we've gotten a lot of these. Like, the last Harry Potter was, what, HP 6.5 or something like that. So, um, it's like operating system software for a Hewlett Packard now with the Harry Potter series. The, the, what, we, what we get here now is on television commercials, it's advertised as Battle colon LA. Everywhere, print. Everywhere. Yeah. Battle colon LA. You watch the movie and the title comes up, it just says Battle Los Angeles. No colon, no LA, just Battle Los Angeles. What is it? Just decide already. You guys make so much money. You know? What is it? It's funny because, you know, we, we complain that... It may sound trivial, but there's a copyright somewhere for a title. I want to know what that title is. See, right there in the one sheet, it says Battle, colon, L.A. You see yeah. the movie, it says Battle, Los Angeles. That's it. So, uh, that's just one thing that they just don't get right in this movie. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Battle, Los Angeles, if you don't already know, 
is an alien invasion film. It is very much in the vein of, uh, of Aliens and uh, Starship Troopers and District 9. By the way, Aliens, Starship Troopers, two films that I absolutely hands down love. I think those are the, uh, those, the, the classics of the form of which battle, what are you scribbling? Uh, just notes. <laughs> Notes that'll humiliate you, that'll shame you, that'll More make me look so much smarter uh, than you, you won't uh, believe it. So I'm going to hide impossible. them from you. That's impossible. Uh, so in the film, uh, Aaron Eckhart uh, leads a group of Marines who have come to Los Angeles to battle these aliens who come to Earth to basically conquer the Earth. It is a war film. And in the, in, in the movie, what, uh, what they do is it's not one of those films where there are phone calls to the president. Mr. President, we have to kill the aliens now. Go to DEFCON 1. The movie is just about this tight group of Marines, and what they need to do is they are stationed in Santa Monica, and they need to go to the Santa Monica police station to extract these civilians who were trapped there because the aliens have overrun the city, and they need to. Uh, Sorry. And go they, on. Need, they, they, they need to take the. They need to get the civilians, extract them from the from the Santa Monica police department, and bring them back to the forward operating base. Now let's take a look at a clip, and then we'll tell you what we thought of the movie. Just a dog. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, just a little doggy. Come here, come here. It's just a dog. 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 What's his name, huh? Glenn. Oh, are you kidding me? Who's the idiot naming dogs these days, Lieutenant? What do you want to call him? Fido? Stand down! Watch your head! That flag on the roof! Watch your head! Yes! Give me an inch down that alley! Stand it! Get out of here! Fuck that alley! Get out! Where'd they come from? What do you see? I don't know, man. We get out of here! Lieutenant, where's the exit at? We're boxed in! We'll take a position by the wall! Go, go! Move out! Hand back! Come on! I don't know! I don't know! I'm here! So the opening of the film, uh, quickly and poorly, establishes each of these Marines. There's, of course, the African-American, and there's the Hispanic. There's a couple of them. There's a couple of them. Yeah. There's the Hispanic, there's the troubled veteran, and it's all kind of, uh, it's all done very quick. And, you know, in the end, we're not going to care anyway. Just get them out there to just fight the aliens. And then once they actually leave, it's nonstop, wall-to-wall -wall action to the point where it's basically like watching somebody else play a video game. That's kind the movie. Of. It's like a first-person shooter. And there's so much action in the film that, in a way, it sort of becomes numbing. And uh, th there's no humor in it. There's no surprises in it. It is all cliched. It is a lousy script. And, what's, and I think that it was a very calculated, uh, it was a calculated effort here to make this thing so hoorah that it's essentially a recruitment film. Because this is the type of movie that the studio feels will be great for anybody who sheds a tear whenever a bunch of Marines give an inspirational speech and yell hoorah. So the, the script, which is written by a guy named uh, Chris Bertolini, who wrote The General's Daughter, his last produced 12 script. 12 years ago. Was 12 years ago. Yeah. Uh, this thing is just a mess. And you know what? The dialogue is very rudimentary. The characters are completely non-existent. And uh, it's essentially 90 minutes of just nonstop action, but that's not necessarily a good thing, is it, Wade? Well, no, look, the, the, you talked about aliens earlier, and there's a lot you can learn from aliens. The things that Jim Cameron does right in aliens, and I still think aliens is one of his best films. Uh, it is, right? Yeah. The, the thing he does, he, he, let, he lets the, the set pieces, he spaces them out so the audience has time to breathe. Because you amp somebody up a little bit, and then you, there's a lull. Okay, we've gotten them. Now what? And suspense builds in those lulls. And then you have another set piece. And then there's a lull. And there's, there's a rhythm to that that good action films use to their advantage. Because you also use that to develop the story, to develop the characters. So you're doing a lot of things at once. This doesn't do any of that. There are no lulls here. There's like one moment of, of uh, like a huge 15-minute lull when nothing's going on. I think it's nighttime and they're at the Santa Monica airport or whatever it is and nothing's going on, but nothing is going on. There, there, there's no suspense, there's no character development, there's, there's nothing, they're just sitting around. And uh, I, I think the film misses all of those elements that you normally use to make a good action film. But again, there's nothing there, like you pointed out. I think the real model here is Independence Day and War of the Worlds, both of which are better films. Both War of the Worlds, in fact, and even Earth versus the Flying Saucers, if we want to go all the way back to that. Um, it, it is... Uh, it's an interesting conceit to try and do this kind of a film strictly from the point of view of a platoon where you never leave their side, 
where you really don't even get a glimpse of the aliens for about a good half hour, 40 minutes, where there's a slow reveal. But then again, we never learn anything about them. We never learn about why they came. There's, no, there's nothing illuminating about it. My biggest beef with this, and by the way, the film was produced by Neil Moritz. Have you ever seen Neil Moritz's name on a movie? Crap. Uh, Neil Moritz, right. The Triple X films and the Fast and the Furious films and Cruel Intentions. It's, it's all junk. The guy makes, he produces like 25 million films a year and they're all, it's all junk. So uh, that's your first, your first beacon to not go to this movie. But uh, the PG-13 here, let's talk about this. Because you said, well, it's like a recruitment film. Now, the King's Speech was rated R because there's one scene where Colin Firth drops a few F-bombs in what is essentially a very humorous and therapeutic moment. Um, let's say you got a 12-year-old daughter. What movie do you take her to? Is she going to be more scarred by Colin Firth dropping a few F-bombs or by this allegedly more suitable PG-13 movie that is non-stop wall-to-wall action in which there's a scene where Aaron Eckhart rips an, a live alien's chest open and starts stabbing around until he finally hits the gusher and all the goop of this thing's heart billows all over his face. Is that more appropriate for your sensitive 12-year-old daughter? You know, this movie really... I don't think so. That language wasn't better for my 12-year-old daughter, the way you put it. This, you know, <laughs> this you, movie graphic. really shows uh, how horrible the MPAA is because... It's appalling. Battle LA is nothing but noise and explosions yeah. and intensity and, and uh, uh, you know, aliens mm -hmm. being ripped apart and scary things happening to kids, by the way. There's a couple children in the film. Yeah. There's children in peril. You know, they're imperiled by the aliens. But somehow, that's a PG-13. But you get a humanist story about a king who needs to overcome a stutter, and because yep. the guy drops a couple F-bombs, he gets an R. Crucial point. One is an independent film, one is a studio film. The MPAA, which controls the ratings board, is studio supported. There's a conflict of interest there. Second point, the ratings, the ratings, uh, the classification and ratings administration exists not to guide parents, but to keep the government happy so that government censorship doesn't step in. How much happier can the government be than to have a film in which Burai Marines are fighting off aliens any way they can? That's going to play well in Washington, but it's not going to play well with parents. And that's what proves the hypocrisy of the MPAA and the CRA, CARA in this. I actually think that, uh, that the, uh, the, the Marine aspect of it, the very yeah. patriotic, it, it's almost like patriot porn at the end. It is. Where they're giving these speeches. And it's actually a, it's such a blatant play for that audience. Yeah. You know, they figure on the coast, they'll love the fact that L.A. is getting uh, destroyed. And in but, Middle America, they'll love the fact that it's a, know, it's a recruitment film. There again, even people who are saying, well, I don't care what these two hosers on TV are saying or on, on Stupid for Movies, forget them. It's just an action film. I'm going to go see an action film. I want to see L.A. get blown up. No, this is not Battle L.A. This is Battle Shreveport. This thing was shot in Shreveport, Louisiana, okay? It was not shot in Los Angeles. So you don't get to see the Hollywood sign blown up. You don't see Man Chinese Theater blown up. You don't see any landmarks destroyed. The only recognizable landmark in it is like the sign over the West Los Angeles station of the LAPD, which no one is going to recognize unless you've driven past it. It's just a mock-up, uh, you know? But that's, that's why I was laughing earlier when you said there's these Marines in Santa Monica. It's like, you know... But that's one of the disadvantages of having it, having it uh, the whole uh, just be a battle platoon. Well, it's that's... not even Battle L.A. It's Battle Santa Monica yeah. and maybe a little bit of Battle West L.A. shot in Shreveport. It's terrible. That's one of the disadvantage of, uh, uh, disadvantages of having the film uh, just surround, just uh, be surrounded yeah. uh, just by these, this one platoon. Yeah. That you don't go outside Santa Monica. You're just with these guys. That's it. Yeah. There's no forward operating base in no. Hollywood. Disneyland doesn't get blown. You don't see no. that. It's not this movie. I mean, honestly, and that's a, that's a how bad do thing. you make a movie called Battle L.A. and not understand that the, the crucial... Look, the reason Independence Day succeeded was because you saw everything recognizable get destroyed. You saw the White House blow up, okay? Nobody ever saw that before. Because... That's, there's something is cinematic about those kinds of catastrophes. No, but how do you those... do a movie called Battle Los Angeles and not show the Hollywood sign or Disneyland getting wasted? Because those how do you movies, do that? those movies have two completely different tones. One is a little bit, a little, a, a little more fun, a little bit cheesy, a little more humor with Will Smith. Yeah. Battle LA wants to be just a all-out action war film. It wants to be just a war film, and it fails. And it fails. Uh, so, okay, uh, buy, rent, burn, Wade. What do you give it? I wonder. Burn. Burn. Well, we all knew that was going to happen. Yes. But did you know this was going to happen? I'm giving it a rent. And why would that be, Mark? Well, here's the thing. The movie is exceedingly dumb. There is no way around it. However, it is also fairly tense throughout. 
Mm -hmm. We were watching the film, and you were saying this: the dialogue is stupid, the aliens are are, are very uh, poorly designed. Oh, they really they're are. They're so busy, I don't even know what the, what they're about. Uh, however, uh, you it held your attention, and you have to admit it held your attention. Uh, barely. Barely. But uh, but what I'm saying is is that it is not a good movie. It no, is a dumb movie. But somehow, because it is so loud, and it is just built on action scene after action scene, loud after loud, explosion after explosion, it does hold your attention. I'm not saying it holds your is interest. That, is that going to work? I'm not saying it holds your interest. I'm saying it holds your attention. It's an interesting distinction. <laughs> is that going to work on DVD or Blu-ray? Uh, you know what? It well well. He, here's where it would work on Blu-ray. If they did a lossless audio mix Perhaps. where it just blew out your speakers. If it was a 7.1 full lossless audio deal, it could be a great Blu-ray. Not a great sure. film, just a great Blu-ray. What if it's monophonic? <laughs> it comes with its own uh, uh, record. Yeah. And a player. You got to put the needle and sync it up. It's fantastic. A little, little All gramophone. Right. All right, so I say, uh, I say rent. See, burn, burn it, that it, sucker. It really is a Brent. It's a burn rent. But you know what? I'll be controversial and say that. All right, fine. All right, so, uh, Wade, here's the situation. Yes. Uh, you went to see a movie. I did, which you're going to see this next week. I'm giving a super special preview. This is part two of our Alien show. Alien show. Uh, I went to see Paul. Now, Paul is the latest film from uh, the team of Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, two terrific British comics and actors who previously did Shaun of the Dead, and uh, really kind of captivated everybody because it was an amazing spoof. And then after that they did... Shaun of the Alive. No. You're not a fan. You're not a Shaun of the Dead fan. They did Hot Fuzz. And uh, both uh, Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz have a... Um, they have like a tongue-in-cheek movie reference thing going to them. Shaun of the Dead in particular is a spoof of, uh, of zombie movies. Hot Fuzz, all about, you know, cop films, Bad Boys 2. And uh, what they're doing here is they're going back to like a science fiction thing. And they've, what they've done is they've made kind of, they wrote the script and they act in it as with all their previous projects. And this is kind of the ultimate fanboy tribute film if you grew up in the 1980s. The problem here is it's a great film, but it's a terrible marketing campaign, which is why Mark originally didn't want to see the film until I saw it and told him that he had to see it. Uh, the marketing is aimed squarely at 20-somethings which is kind of odd because Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz didn't really do that well with 20-something, so I would think they'd go for the same market here. But the advertising is riding very heavily on director Greg Matola, who did Superbad. They're saying from the guy who brought you Superbad. So it's really, I don't think, I don't think the studio really knows what they want to do with this movie. It's, it's a real miscalculation. But people in their 40s, late 30s to kind of mid 40s, late 40s, anybody who grew up with E.T., Close Encounters, Raiders of the Lost Ark, all those great movies from the late 70s to the mid 80s, they're going to love this film. It's loaded with references. Um, do we have a clip? We have a clip. Let's see a clip. Are you an alien? To you I am, yes. Are you going to probe us? Why does everyone always assume that? What am I doing? Am I harvesting farts? How much can I learn from an ass? Well, I, I, what? I'm sorry. What's your name? But it's Graham Willie. And what's his name? Uh, that's the writer, Clive Gollings. Okay, cool. I'm Paul. Paul? Yeah. It's a nickname that's stuck. I, I, my ship crashed on a dog. It doesn't matter. Look. If you don't help me, I could die on this road tonight. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Great. Okay. Help me. Help me grab him. Let's. This man's Peter's pants. So if the voice of Paul sounds familiar, it should. It's Seth Rogen. And it's actually really, really good casting. Uh, you get over the fact that it's Seth Rogen's voice coming out of an alien very, very quickly. The idea here is that um, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost are a couple of British fanboys who've come to the U.S. just to go to Comic-Con. And they have this amazing time at Comic-Con. It's so fabulous. And then while they're on the rest of their fanboy tour, Area 51 and all that, uh, this escaped alien named Paul winds up jumping into their giant RV with them. And next thing you know, they're on the lam from government agents and everything else and let the references and the homages flow. Uh, Kristen Wiig from uh, Saturday Night Live is hysterical in this. Bill Hader, also from Saturday Night Live, very funny. Um, Sigourney Weaver has a brief part. Um, Jason Bateman, very, very good. I mean, it's a terrific cast. It's a really clever script because it's an homage script. It's a tribute script, but it also works on its own merits. So it's not working just because you go, oh, isn't that a clever reference? Isn't that a funny reference? I remember that movie. I saw that movie. It really is a great story. It's got a lot of heart. 
it's got a lot of edge to it. Uh, the fact that you have this alien who's been in the you know in captivity for so many decades that he's picked up all of these horrible human habits: swearing, uh, smoking, uh, drinking, uh, smoking weed. You know, he is he is the quintessential hippie person in the body of an alien. It is it's really a great it's a great gimmick. So um, the movie is terrific. I just don't know if the marketing isn't going to work for it, but it's absolutely a great film. Anybody who has an affinity for that period and those kinds of films in the 80s, got to see this movie. And Greg Matola, by the way, forget about Superbad, also did Adventureland and The Day Trippers, which are kind of his, those are more his auteur films. He's a really good independent filmmaker and has a real affinity for the 80s. And he directs this thing with all of the same little camera movements that you would have seen in a Spielberg film in the 80s. There are even camera movements that reference specific moments in 80s films. It's very well put together, very well conceived, script all the way to direction, great film. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little worried about the movie, and I'll tell you why, because when you take like Hot Tub Time Machine yeah. in the 80s, yeah. Take Me Home Tonight in the 80s, mm -hmm. The 80s are just not hitting with today's audiences. And it's funny because, you know, we talk about this all the time. Yeah. We talk about this all the time. You get development executives who grew up in the 80s. Yeah. And now they're in their True. 40s or whatever. And they're greenlighting these films because they love it. Yeah. And then they go and they market it to kids who are 20 who weren't even alive. Giant mistake. It's, it's, it's a like, giant mistake. It's like the remake. Well, when they remake films that, the, films that are based on TV series from the 70s and 80s and expect kids in their 20s to have some point of reference there, too. Also stupid. You know, Magnum P.I., Starsky and Hutch, uh, you know, all of these feature films uh, that are in the past or even planned, they're not going to connect with kids in their 20s. So um, it's, it, that's very odd. But they, it, this film can succeed as long as people in their 30s and 40s know that it's for them and not for 20-year-olds. Well, you know what, then, th then they have to do what we, what we always talk about, which is they have to let that thing stay in theaters you a little bit to. longer got because... To. People in their 40s, 30s and 40s and whatever who would get this movie, they're not going to run out the first weekend. They're, no, they're not. not. No. They're not. And what's going to happen is it won't open well, and then, and then screens will start, they'll start dumping it. Yeah. Exhibitors will dump it. And it'll do well on DVD and Blu-ray or it'll streaming. It'll probably do well on DVD. Yeah. I, you know, I think the best way to get some of these 70s, uh, these old 70s uh, TV shows that are updated into films, mm -hmm. the best way to do it is if you, or really your best shot, is if you really update the casting. You know, you get Charlie's Angels where you get the three hot women who were yeah. hot at the time, you know? Uh, Starsky and Hutch tried it with the two hipster guys. I think there's a way to do it so that, because what happens is the, uh, the studios think, uh, you know, we just remake the Mod Squad. People who are in their 40s will come because they love the Mod Squad. Not true. But people in their 20s will come because we've cast blah, yeah. blah, yeah. and they'll love it. Look, look, I mean, look at the Green Hornet. The Green Hornet is like, what, people in their 70s will come because they love the Green Hornet? Neil, Mar Neil Moritz produced the Green Hornet, too. I'm just saying. Okay. And, you know, so I, I, you know, I would not open, what I would do is I would not open Paul in 2,500 theaters. No. I would not do that. You open, well, actually, Paul shouldn't even be released at this time of year. Paul is the kind of movie that you release, you make it a summer film, you release it in June, but you platform it. You release it in 40 markets. And, and then you expand it to, say, about 100, 200 screens. And then by August, when all the big movies have burned off and you've developed word of mouth and there's nothing else to see in August and people in their 40s and 30s still want to go see something, then you blow it out to about 850, 900 screens. You don't open it in 2,500 screens. You'll do much better that way. I mean, it's a, it's a terrific film, and it deserves to have a real life in, in, uh, in exhibition. But I, I don't know if they're going to treat it that way. Well, Wade, as you know, yeah. I didn't want to see it. I thought, Paul... I'm oh. over Seth Rogen. Seth Rogen, I'm over it. Yes. And, and you know, it. honestly, I was I was on the fence about this. I, I thought, you know what? Frost, Peg, love those guys. The alien looks kind of stupid. Seth Rogen's annoying me lately. Uh, it, it looks like they've really, really kind of gone overboard on this one. I don't know if I'm going to like this. Uh, I was really, really on the fence about it, and uh, it won me over. I mean, it won me over instantly. Mm. First scene. First scene. Yeah, all right. Terrific. Well, I'm looking forward to Terrific. it now. <laughs> All right, so uh, so there you go. That's this weekend in movies, Wade. Rock on. And it's also, in a way, next weekend in movies. Little because bit. Because Wade talked about Paul. A <laughs> little bit. We do not have a graphic for Dude, next. Let's play this weekend in movies again since it's also next weekend. This weekend in movies slash next weekend in movies. It works. It works. 
All right, so we've done the movie thing. Now, Wade, it's 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 a, it's a big weekend. Yes. Uh, it's a big weekend entertainment. We're not just talking about Charlie Sheen. We're not. We're not talking about Charlie Sheen. We are the drugs. Sheen. <laughs> I'm sorry, who? <laughs> We're not talking about Charlie Sheen. Cue it. I don't, wait. I, just, I did just do that. Okay. Drugs. There we go. Okay. I, I, I can't. It's, it's such an unfair <laughs> test. It really isn't fair. Uh, but now we got other stuff to talk about. Wait, more important news to talk about. We have news with Chad Vader. Woo! Chad Vader! <laughs> I do not need this piece of paper anymore, Chad. Goodbye to it. Okay, sounds good to me. What's going on there? Oh, so much is going on in the news. <laughs> Tell us about it. Wow. I will. Warner Brothers will start offering digital movie rentals through Facebook, starting with Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight. The cost per rental is 30 Facebook credits, which amounts to about $3. In related news, the Financial Times reports that the Facebook credit is strong against the euro and the Japanese yen <laughs> in the world money market. The dollar has slipped against the Facebook credit, forecasting doom for the popular U.S. currency. This reporter has drawn out all of his savings and cashed in his 401k and is converting it all to Facebook credits, which means that I now have a strong, secure financial future and I can watch The Dark Knight about 300 times. <laughs> you know... Uh, I don't even know such things as Facebook credits exist. Is, is that new? I still don't know how to even get them. What's a Facebook credit? Is that new? Like, you can buy, like, yeah. goofy little gifts and stuff for people, but I think this is, like, the first... Credits. Yeah, how like, do you farm earn, bill stuff and How whatnot. do you earn them? You, you, you don't earn them. You purchase them with, with American yeah. money, with hard-earned cash. It just does, still doesn't make sense you to know, me. You know, when you look at this, and you look at Sony's announcement today... That oh, the there's, an I, there's an iPhone app now where, I don't know how much the app is, uh, it hasn't been announced yet, but there's an iPhone app where you can actually, it will, Sony will send you a clip from one of their films every day. Every day. Every day with this app. With this you're app. You're sitting around and you're wasting, you're just wasting away with your useless little life and you think, I want to enhance my life. Let's see what clips Sony has to show me today. And you open up that app and it enriches your life with 30 seconds of something from Cruel Intentions. And you think, thank you, Neil Moritz. That is rich. Uh, so you can, oh, so, but here's the thing. It's, but it's a pattern, and it's a pattern that's not going to stop, which is the studios are scrambling to find ways to make money with some of this new media stuff. But they're, they're, trying, they're still trying to make money off the wrong audience. It, they're, they're, it's unbelievable. They're still stuck on this idea that somehow anyone who's 15 to 25 represents the coveted demographic, and we've got to have them. And you have these billion-dollar corporations all chasing the same demo when most of the disposable income and the disposable time rests with older demos. I mean, they, I don't know why they can't get that through their heads. I don't know why they can't figure that out. Because older, de because younger demos see the movies on the first weekend, which makes, which, which to them puts more money in the studios' pockets, which makes the stockholders happier when the quarterly reports come and out. And there's the problem. That's what it is. And there's the problem. It's about quarterly reporting. That's true. It's about quarterly reporting. It, you know, movies have a cycle. It takes about a year to make a movie. Okay. And they have a seasonal cycle. And you, when you're beholden to stockholders and quarterly reporting, you're not doing what's best for movies. You know, movie studios should not be publicly owned. And neither should sports teams. You heard it here. Chad, what do you think? Should uh, sports teams and movie studios be publicly owned? Be no. honest. I, yes, I should <laughs> own them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what else you got there, Chad? Sony Pictures has begun production on Men in Black 3 with only the first act of the film actually scripted out. Oh gosh. The complicated, yeah, you're right. <laughs> the complicated time travel related plot has caused script writing difficulties, delaying the finished script and forcing the film into production without a script. New York tax incentives have been cited as the reason for the early start, but I know the real reason. That's right, me, Chad Vader has it all figured out. They actually have a time machine. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need a script, man. Once they finish writing it, however long that is down the road, they can just travel back in time and fix everything. They're time travelers. 
We're through the looking glass, people. Up is down, black is white, puppies are kitties, and old people <laughs> are, are young people. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I confused myself and forgot what I was talking about. Oh yeah, Men in Black 3. <laughs> when reached for comment, star Will Smith said, quote, Oh, hell no! And <laughs> quote. <laughs> That joke, Chad, was a hit. Right here. <laughs> in the room. Thank in you. the room. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, here's the thing. You know, it, it, by the way, whenever you shoot without a script, I don't care what they say, it always leads to good things. Honestly, that is, there, there are, this has been going on for decades, and there is, there is such a littered history, such a battlefield of movies that have tanked because they started shooting without a script and thought that they could somehow fix it on the fly. And, and it never works. I mean, Gangs of New York kind of sort of pulled it off because it wound up getting an Oscar nomination for Best Picture just because Scorsese did it. But it wasn't a good film and it didn't make money. You know, and these movies never turn out well. I, I'm just not sure about this whole thing about the uh, New York Tax Incentives. I mean, look, Adjustment, that, that, that's... Adjustment Bureau shot in New York and they, yeah. they saved about 30%. Just on tax, just on the, tax breaks. But I don't know the tax breaks. I, I don't know that their breaks were expiring, where they had to shoot it by a certain well, date. Well, the, the tax breaks typically work is that they are granted to you on a certain date, and there there is a time frame, and you have to use them by a certain time frame, so that those who are benefiting from the tax breaks can cash them in on the on the attributed tax year. Though, so there is kind of a timetable attached to it. Different states do them differently. I'm not quite sure how New York does it, but it does make sense that there would be some kind of an expiration that they'd have to be facing. But I, but I can't imagine that they couldn't work that out with the state of New York or with the investors for the sake of getting a script. I mean, come on. So, so essentially the movie will be bad Make thirty percent less because it sucks, exactly. which will make up for the thirty percent they saved I guess. by rushing it to to completion in New York. Yeah, who knows? That exactly, makes, exactly. That makes sense to me. No, it does. Chad, that made sense to you, right? It makes total sense. <laughs> See. In other words, it made no sense. Chad, you're supposed uh, to stick up for me. What else, Chad? Tom Ortenberg, whoever that is, will be starting a new distribution company with AMC and Regal two of the biggest theater chains in the country. The company will be called Open Road and is considered to be the next step in the evolution of film distribution, promising to distribute small independent films as well as large commercial ones. And that sounds great. This is one of those stories that Stupid for Movies producer Mike Rotman refers to as inside baseball, which <laughs> means that Wade and Mark We'll get very excited about it and talk about it in great detail. And you, the viewer at home, will be lulled into a drowsy stupor. <laughs> so take it away, guys, and I will take this opportunity to catch up on my online Scrabble game. <laughs> okay, here's the thing with this story. Now, it's a I, great story. It's a great story. It is inside baseball, but it's meaningful to everybody. It's important. It is. I very think, important. Look, the... Exhibitors now are feeling very pressured. Yeah. Because they're at the mercy of the studio. They're at the mercy of the studios who want to start selling films on VOD yeah. for thirty bucks a pop four weeks after they they uh, they're released theatrically, mm -hmm. and the, the the theaters are feeling totally squeezed. So they've got to come up with a way to do it themselves. The economics have been pinching exhibitors increasingly over the years, which means that movies are you know it, the way it works is when a movie opens. Uh, the, the opening weekend is like, say, 75% goes to the distributor and 25% to the, to the exhibitor. And that shifts more and more in favor of the exhibitor as the months go on. And that used to be great when movies would stay around for 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 months. Then by the end of that, exhibitors are getting a big chunk of that. But now movies are making most of their money in the first two weekends and four weeks out, they're gone. And exhibitors are, you know, by the time their share increases, they're not getting, they're getting, you know, 80% of nothing. Which is why your popcorn prices go up. Exactly. And what uh, Ortenberg and uh, Regal and AMC are saying is, we're going to make our own movies and we're going to give ourselves all the money. It's kind of vertical integration. And is it, uh, you know, is there an antitrust thing going on? Not really, because they're regaining power that they've lost over the last couple of decades to the studios. So I think they could, if, if suddenly... The studios realize, you know what, I, we, uh, we're, why, why can't we get 2,000 screens for this movie? Why are all of our screens going to these little independent films? Well, it's because 
the exhibitors now are giving themselves a bigger piece of smaller movies, which nets them more money than a small piece of a big movie. And that could impact how the studios make movies, how they release movies, how much they spend on movies. It could, really, it could even impact theater price, uh, ticket prices. So, I mean, this could change everything. It's not going to happen immediately. It's going to happen gradually. But five years from now, we could see a very, very different landscape. I, it, yes. It just depends ultimately on the quality of the films. Yes. You know, I think that Which is... Which is why I trust Ortenberg. Because Ortenberg, who used to run Lionsgate and uh, who then had a very brief and unfortunate stint running the Weinstein Company, uh, I interviewed, I've interviewed Ortenberg two or three times over the years. And in uh, 2006, when I, I wrote an article for Box Office about how catastrophic that summer was... Well, I'm, I'm going to play my Scrabble app, actually. I, 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 honestly, honestly, I talked to uh, every distribution exec at every studio in town, except for Universal, who was afraid of me. And the only one who had a clue was Ortenberg. He was amazing. Ortenberg is a genius, and I'm thrilled that he's running a company again. And he will, he will prove his mettle. Done with Scrabble? Are you actually playing against Chad right huh? now? He might be. <laughs> I could never be Chad, Chad Vader's Scrabble. <laughs> Chad, He's brilliant. Chad looks like he just nailed uh, a word with a couple of X's in it. Chad, you're back. Yeah. Come on. Triple word score. <laughs> there you go. All right, Chad, anything else? Is that it for the news this week? It's a big week. That's it, man. All right. Brilliant. All right, Chad, enjoy Scrabble. We'll see you next week. Thank you. I always enjoy Scrabble. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Chad, everybody. <laughs> Woo! Woo! We like to call him Chad Triple Word Vader. Yes. That's what we call him. So, Wade, uh, you're right. You know what? This distribution thing could be great. And the thing is, with these, don't forget, with these films, when you walk into an, an AMC or Regal, you're going to see the posters for the AMC Regal film. Yes, you will. You're going to see the trailer for the AMC Regal yep. film. When you walk into a theater, there'll definitely be some uh, push at the theater. Now, will these guys have enough money to buy the TV time and buy the ad space? Not initially, but eventually. And it depends also on if they're, if they're able to bring in outside investors. And uh, it'll be very interesting to see what this does to Windows, release Windows with DVD and, and streaming and all of that. I mean, everything could change because of this. And it's interesting, you know, not to get nerdy, but historically it all changed with the Paramount Consent Decree in the late 40s, which forced the studios to sell their theaters. Studios used to own all the theaters. And when they had to sell the theaters, they couldn't control exhibition anymore. This is like the reverse of that. And it, uh, by having now exhibitors becoming distributors and producers, it could completely change everything all over again. My, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. My, my fear, yes. my fear, is that it will be a success. Now, why is that a fear? That if it's a success, that means that the studios will give up on those $25 million dramas forever and and they'll produce even more $200 million tentpole films, which will take up more space in the cultural conversation. I'm going to say no. no. I'm going to say no, that's not going to happen. And the reason that's not going to happen is because the only way that you can justify a $200 million movie is if you can get it, uh, if you can get it a public profile. And the only way you get it a public profile is by getting it into theaters first. Movie theaters are the filtering mechanism. It's what sort of knights a movie. Anything that goes straight to streaming, straight to TV, straight to DVD, is like second tier. But if you make it to theaters, somehow that ordains you as a real movie. And that's the only way that you can get the, the level of awareness necessary to justify a $200 million budget and a $150, $200 million in marketing. But uh, you know, if you can't get those screens, if you can't get that exposure, if you're being squeezed out of the theaters, suddenly the leverage goes back to the exhibitors. I just can't imagine, you know, Thor 2 getting squeezed out of theaters in favor of a $25 million drama. Uh, you know what? Because uh, kids, kids are going to clamor for that movie. They're going to they, want to see they Thor. They will. They will. But it gives the exhibitors more leverage to say, we don't want this. We want, we want DVD, the DVD window to blow out to 12, you know, 12 more weeks. We want this in theaters longer. And we want a bigger piece of the pie. That'd be great. That'd be great. Will that happen? That'd be happen? wonderful. Will, will that happen? Only time will tell. It'll, it'll just get more leverage for the exhibitors is a good thing. By the way, my favorite Van Halen lyric of all time, hmm. only time will tell if we stand the test of time. Yeah! <laughs> all right, there you go. Van Halen. J-Mac hears that. You know, what, you know what else J-Mac hears? The idea that you can watch movies at a home, Wade. It's unbelievable. You stream yes. these great movies on a segment we like to call... Instant gratification, cut the cord! You know what? You know what really it is? 
It's the segment so nice we named it twice. Oh, that's good. That's, good. that's what it is. Now wait, here's uh, here's what uh, we've been doing. Yes. We've been uh, talking about these uh, movies, right? You. Uh, uh, we do talk about movies on this show occasionally. You can uh, stream movies for free. Yes, you can. And it's not like the crap movies that they used to have that I used to complain about. Right. There's good movies now. Oh yeah. You know, in fact, I have to say, and this, the, I'm, I'm, I just, I'm not saying this for the show. I've been thinking of getting rid of the uh, the Netflix mail. I, th I may just do streaming. Okay. And I'm, I'm not saying that to say it. I, I was thinking to myself, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, uh, most of what I want at this point is streamable. Okay. You know. I'm not going to argue with you. Yes, you are. Well, maybe. Okay. But let's see what you got. So here's what's going to happen. Uh, Wade and I each have two films that we would like to uh, recommend that is streamable. <laughs> One more time. Streamable. Oh, oh all right. We'll take and, it. And uh, we will talk about the film, talk about why we like it, tell you where you can see it. And uh, I believe I will start, Wade. Please. What do you think of that? Please. Uh, on Netflix, <clears throat> which is uh, seven ninety nine per month, is Bad Boys. Now, hang on, folks. Know what you're saying? You're saying bad boy. Is that Michael Bay piece of ass? Oh hell no! Nah. Oh hell no! Nah. <laughs> Where's Chad? Get him back. Uh, bad Boys is from 1983. It stars uh, yeah. Sean Penn, and it was directed by Rick Rosenthal. This is a terrific movie. It's a very tough and gritty film about Chicago street gangs. Sean Penn plays a young punk who is uh, thrown in uh, jail, and when he goes to jail, he finds out what it's really like to be in jail. And this film tells you what it's really like to be in jail. It is tough and it is excruciating, and it is painful, and you will get hurt. And don't forget, folks, this is 1983. You didn't, you know, before 1983, it was like The Warriors, which is like cartoonish, or like West Side Story, which is like a big Warriors musical. Right. But three. Bad Boys, it really told you what it was like, and it was very arresting at the time. And in the film, Isai Morales plays um, Penn's street rival, who was sent to the same prison as Penn after he rapes Penn's sister, or Penn's girlfriend. So it was a big, big deal at the time. Uh, it got a lot of critical acclaim. It's a terrific movie. It doesn't sentimentalize the, uh, the experience of being in prison. You know, Shawshank Redemption, which I think is a classic, yeah. that's another take on prison life. This is like totally different. This is a 180. This is an intense film. At the time, Sean Penn had done some stuff, but he wasn't really, he didn't really take that dramatic turn until he starred in Bad Boys. And uh, it's a very good film. It was directed by uh, this guy, Rick Rosenthal, whose career went kind of nowhere. He wound up doing a lot of TV. He's still around. Yeah. But really, his best film is Bad Boys. I think this film is just terrific. Uh, I'm not as enthused about it as you are. I, I, it's, it's, I don't think it dates that very well, but uh, Sean Penn's performance is terrific. Hey, I like hey, it. hey, it's I fine. Like it. You're welcome to like it. I just I don't think it dates very well. It still it looks a little ragged around the edges. But Sean Penn is great in it. It was it really was a turning point for his career. He went from Spicoli to this guy, and suddenly he was a real actor. And that was you know it, it's very it would have been very easy for him to just coast on Spicoli and to become the Pauly Shore of the 1980s. He could very easily have done that, and his career would have gone the direction of Pauly Shore's career. He would have just evaporated when that kind of ran dry. There can only be one Pauly Shore. Exactly. <laughs> But but instead, you know, he uh, he said, I'm going to show a different side. And he did this, and people suddenly took him very, very seriously. And he was able to really mix it up thereafter, and it still is. So uh, that was a really crucial moment in his career. I agree. Rick Rosenthal, good director. Don't know why he's not doing features now. He should be. True, true. Should so be. that is uh, Bad Boys from 83 is on Netflix Instant. Now, Wade, what is your first pick? I am going to go with a choice from Amazon. This is uh, Amazon Prime membership or $2.99 as a rental with Amazon free account. We're talking about Amadeus, the director's cut. Now, Amadeus, of course, won Best Picture uh, in uh, 1984. And, um, you know, it, it, it's a great film. I have problems personally with Tom Hulse's performance. Don't like it. But the movie itself is terrific. Despite that, great direction from Milos Forman. This was the second of three best pictures that uh, uh, producer Saul Zantz would win, which, by the way, is a record uh, tied with Sam Spiegel. And um, the director's cut is even better. It's, uh, it's different in some very significant ways, ways which I think actually make Hulse's performance better, uh, makes the character richer, makes the movie more interesting. It has been available on DVD and Blu-ray for a little while, but uh, no reason necessarily to uh, not watch it uh, if you just feel like you want to hear some great music and watch one of the great films of the 80s. Best Picture winner, very deservedly so, even though I personally preferred Passage to India that same year. David Lean fetish of mine. But never mind, Amadeus, still a great film. Uh, definitely watch that on Amazon. It, you know what? It is a great film. It, yeah. to it totally holds up. And, you know, when you say you don't like Hulse's performance, 
you know, we have this conversation a lot where if you don't like a performance, is it the actor or is it the director? True. Because the director's case, job is to steer the performance in the way that he requires. I mean, in this case, it's not even. I, I, sh I should be a little more fair. It's you know, it's the the original stage production is what created the character, in that sort of forged the character in that wacky way, and that may be a little bit the 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 problem that I had with it. But that being said, costumes, photography, uh, art direction, F. Murray Abraham as Salieri, who you know would win his uh, Best Actor Oscar for it. I mean. As a production, we just don't get movies like this anymore. It is opulent. It is extravagant. It is intense with detail. Uh, it is just. It is, it is a beautifully, beautifully executed and mounted film. It recreates uh, the period magnificently, and there's not a drop of CGI anywhere in it. So, bravo. This is what movies are supposed to be. Wait, wait, wait. There's no CGI? No. I can't see that. I know, right? No CGI. Does anything transform? There is a scene where F. Murray Abraham Turns into gets a Chevy? really, he, he gets, <laughs> Turns into yeah, a Chevy. he does, and he mows Mo Mozart down. It's my, it's my favorite moment in the film. Yeah. So that's on uh, Amazon, right? Yes. Now, uh, on uh, Hulu Plus, my second pick of the week, on Hulu Plus, which is uh, a $7.99 per month, is uh, In the Heat of the Night from 1967. Uh, Rod Steiger won an Oscar for his portrayal uh, of a bigoted small town sheriff who was forced to conduct a murder investigation with a big city African-American detective played by Sidney Poitier. And their reluctant team up sort of uh, is the core of the film. And, you know, in the movie, Steiger resents the idea that this big city African-American cop would tell him, and this is Mississippi now, right? So this is years ago in Mississippi. He resents the fact that this African-American detective from the big city would tell him how to do his job. And what's great about the film is that it is definitely a message movie, but there is such fireworks between the two of them. And what's remarkable about it is that Poitier does not play the insulting, magical Negro cliched character who we've now sort of be gotten used to with Legend of Bagger Vance and all these other movies that are kind of insulting to African Americans. Here, it's like Steiger uh, is a bigot but slowly he starts to maybe grudgingly respect Poitier, whereas Poitier, in the film, he's not always a very nice man. He's, he's very indignant, and not that he doesn't have a right to be, but there's, I remember there's a, there's a scene in the film when Poitier actually slaps a white woman, and Steiger says, look at you, you're just like us. So there's a lot of back and forth that yeah. is very intense, and nobody's let off the hook, and it's just a terrific movie. And, you know, uh, you almost have to go back to, to kind of get into the history of the film because the movie takes place in Mississippi, but in the Deep South, they did not want that movie shooting there because it involved a strong African-American character. So director Norman Jewison had to find another place to shoot the film. And so they shot it in another state. And what's super remarkable about the film is that that movie, which won Best Picture, the Best Picture of 1967, was a turning point in Hollywood history. And here's why. In 1967, here are the five films that were nominated for Best Picture. Dr. Doolittle, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, The Graduate, In the Heat of the Night, Bonnie and Clyde. Now why is that remarkable? Because as the studio system was ending and the independent films, the, the, those great 70s films that we love were starting to kind of emerge, you've got uh, Dr. Doolittle, bloated studio film, one of the last of the bloated studio films. Talk to the animals. Talk to the animals. You've got Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, the Stanley Kramer film, which is one of those, you know, completely self-congratulatory uh, uh, liberal message movies, right? You've got, you've got The Graduate and Bonnie and Clyde, which was on the total new forefront. That was the new frontier of Hollywood. Yeah. And so right in the middle, where you've got something that, that does have some artistry to it, and yet it's still, it's still like an old school Hollywood film, is In the Heat of the Night. And in the way, that's the film that sort of split the difference, and that's what won. But after that, then the Body and Clydes and the graduates of, of Hollywood mm -hmm. started to take over. The Easy Riders, the Midnight <sighs> Cowboys. That 1967 was the watershed year of that. Let me just point out, this was a year where we had The Graduate, Bonnie and Clyde, and In the Heat of the Night all nominated for Best Picture. All of those in one year. When was the last time we had three major landmark classic films of that caliber in one year? Uh, 1980. 76. 1980. 1980 was Raid. No, it was um, Ordinary People Raging Bull and the Elephant Man. And, uh, you know. Uh, well, 76 was Bound for Glory, yeah. uh, Rocky. But it's been decades. Mm, it has. Not in the, in the last 20, 25 years, we haven't had that kind of a lineup. 
because now it's all about making sure that Inception is nominated so that kids will watch it's the ridiculous. Oscars. That's it's what absurd. it's about now. No, it's a great, a great movie. In the Heat of the Night is, a, is an absolutely terrific film. Uh, beautifully, beautifully made. Uh, Norman Jewison did not win Best Director, by the way. He won, uh, they won Best Picture. I forget who won Best Director that year, but it was not, uh, it was not Norman Jewison. So no. he got an Oscar for his, as a producer, but not as a director. But um, tremendous movie and uh, not a bad TV series eventually when they... With Carol O'Connor. Carol O'Connor, yeah. As, uh, as the detective. And the Steiger part. And uh, Howard, Harold, Howard Rollins. Yes, the yeah. poor Rollins who yeah. had such a troubled life. Yeah. You know, he's a terrific actor from Ragtime. Great By the way, Ragtime, uh, uh, buy it. Oh, it's an early buy, rent, or burn, Ragtime. All right, wait. So that's uh, in the heat of the night from 1967. It's available on Hulu Plus. First that's month free, right. seven ninety nine per month after that. And I got another choice from Hulu Plus, seven ninety nine. Seven ninety nine. This is from uh, 1957, the Ingmar Bergman film Wild Strawberries, starring Victor Sjöström. This is a foreign film. So those of you that don't like subtitles, too damn bad. Do it anyway. It's good for your soul. Wild Strawberries is, uh, in many respects, uh, Ingmar Bergman's most accessible film. It is uh, a little more sentimental than what you normally get from him. It is, not, uh, it is not a brooding movie about death and anxiety and existential crises and, and darkness and loneliness and people killing each other on a desolate island. This is a movie about an old man who is on a bit of a road trip and along this, the course of this trip, um, there are these kinds of dreamlike encounters with his past. His memories sort of re return to haunt him and you trace his life in flashback and it is a, it is a beautiful, poignant, very touching film. Uh, rather a remarkable script in many respects and beautifully photographed. Uh, also happens to be one of Stanley Kubrick's m favorite films of all time. Kubrick loved Wild Strawberries and was profoundly influenced by it throughout his career as have a lot of other filmmakers. Uh, this, I think, is sort of the, the perfect moment for Bergman, because Bergman, at a certain point, uh, went a little bit self-indulgent, making some things like Cries and Whispers and Autumn Sonata, things which get much more melodramatic, much more claustrophobic. Once he gets into the 70s, not quite the strong filmmaker that he was prior to that. And uh, so this sits right in that perfect sweet spot of Bergman's career where it is artsy, it is European, but at the same time, it's very emotionally accessible, very, very touching. And uh, you can't go wrong. Even if you think you don't like foreign films, watch Wild Strawberries. You will not regret it. You know, um, everybody talks about Bergman and they yeah. make fun of Bergman and how inaccessible he was and how he was so brooding. If you really want to start with a film, this is a good one. This is a good one to start with. Yeah. You know, Wild Strawberries. It's a, just a terrific film. And uh, it's available in, on Hulu Plus. Yep. First month free. Yep. $7.99 after that. Wait, Beautiful you can film. afford $7.99. Uh, probably, not. probably not, actually. I don't know. I'll take that back. I don't know. So there you go. That's instant gratification. Cutting the cord. Yes. The segment's so nice. We named it twice. Wow. All right. So uh, uh, we do not have Philip Nelson uh, this week, although we definitely miss uh, Philip Nelson's parental guidance. But uh, no Philip this week. Uh, but we have one more thing to do, Wade. The thing that everybody waits for every week, Wade. Everybody loves it. What is it? BRB, yo. Byron to burn. Very good the way you sort of ran. I wasn't supposed to. Uh, I wasn't supposed to. Uh, uh, I was supposed to admit that there was some behind the scenes shenanigans. Oh, while that open was, was going live, live TV, live internet TV. It's 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 tight. I it thought really it was is. very graceful. Tight. Yes, it was very well done. Well done. All right, so Byron to burn, uh, sweeping the nation. If that is, if the nation is uh, comprised of this garage, um, you, uh, what's going to happen is because Mike isn't here, Corey Ooh. is going to say the name of a film. <laughs> and then we're going to say whether you should buy it, rent it, or burn it. My buy, rent, or burn. Buy, rent, or burn. <laughs> okay. Was, okay. Wait, wait, okay. hang on now. Is, is, is Mike in the chat room? Of yeah. course he yeah. is. Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, the Red Sox suck. Papelbon, he's going to blow his uh, arm out. It's all over. It's not going to happen. The, uh, less uh, 500, if, if, if pipe dream we got, 500. We got another Sox fan in the room. Huh? You're insulting Emily. I'm a Mets fan. Who cares about the Sox? All right, so, so Corey, uh, what, do, what do we got? This is inside. This is literally inside baseball now, right? <laughs> okay, so you, the viewers, have submitted your buy, rent, or burn. You give us a movie, we tell you, you guys, not, not me, I'm not going to tell them. You guys, the experts, are going to tell them whether to buy, rent, or burn it. And we have submissions today from Facebook. We have from Michael Ambrosino on Facebook. Ready for this one? Yes. You are. You look. Wow. You got. You look ready. <laughs> Kung Pao. Enter the fist. 
I'm uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to scare everybody that was. here. What was that? that was very odd. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to scare everybody here. I'm going to say, bye. No, that's a funny movie. <laughs> it's very funny movie. Punch power to the fist. Bye. Yeah, it's no, funny. It, it is honestly very funny. It's it kind of plays off of the same conceit as uh, What's Up Tiger Lily, which is that they they took an old uh, kung fu movie. Starring Jimmy Wang Yu, by the way. Jimmy Wang Yu it was the original star of this. And Jimmy Wang Yu also... I graduated from Jimmy Wang Yu. And, <laughs> and Jimmy Wang Yu also starred in and directed Master of the Flying Guillotine, which has been released twice on DVD. I'm on both commentaries. Yeah, Woo, buy that. Oh Scrabble app. Um, what's, yeah, no. what, what, what's the seven-letter word for who gives a crap? Uh, uh, Kaiser. Oh! Wow. Oh, that's for the clip reel. Thank you. No, I, honestly, they, they took it and, and uh, reconfigured it, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it's great. It's terrific. It's no, really it's, funny. Yep, I agree. Totally it's really agree. crazy. There's no way to describe it. It's just really silly but This is funny. supposed to be the lightning round. See how Mike yeah, let's do it. It's the lightning say, round. This is just about the time okay, that Mike go. would get weary. Yeah. By the way, okay. I, do, I do have to add, and I'm going to slow things down for a second. We neglected to mention at the top of the show, in keeping with, with our previous history, we have buy, rent, burn, or... Green Hornet. Oh, oh nice. Green Hornet. Somebody better oh. recommend don't, something that don't sucks. Don't force it, but okay. should the opportunity it, it should arise. Should the opportunity arise. Yes. I, I got you. I'm with you. It's still not okay. as bad as that last Airbender, I have to say. Yeah, but we go year by year. Like oh, we go yeah. year by year? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think that's what we did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. From Clint Sanders on Facebook, Black Snake Moan. Hmm. Rent. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to echo that. I'm going to say rent as well. Very, uh, uh, what, what do we say about Black Snake? Well, you know what? It's, uh, it's, it's good. Very atmospheric, very Very florid. atmospheric. Christina Ricci's terrific. Samuel L. Jackson is terrific. It's, uh, it's a, it, it, walks, it walks a tightrope of political correctness and appropriateness that is going to really offend a lot of people. And if, if you're offended by this movie, good. You deserve to be offended. But uh, I, I, I don't know if it works as well on a second viewing. So that's why I'm going to say Rent. Because I, I think it's very effective the first time you see it, but I don't know if you necessarily want to. I don't, I don't see anybody sitting around saying, gosh, I'm in a black snake moan mood. I think I'll watch that a second time. <laughs> I don't know. She's Lightning very round sweaty way. in that Rent. movie. Sorry. Yeah. Lightning round. Sweaty and naked. Rent. Yeah. Wow. Go. Okay. Next. One Next. of my favorite combos. From Hunter Stewart on Facebook, Bubba Hotep. Uh, oh, that's the, uh, the, the, the Bruce Campbell the, thing, the, the right? Bruce Campbell with, you know Elvis, uh, with Elvis and the, the, the Egyptian okay. deal. It's like Everybody loves Bruce Campbell. He runs mm -hmm. around and freaks out and goes crazy. They're, they're, uh, I'm going to say Rent. I, 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 I'm going to say Rent. I, I guess Rent. It's because it's weird and indescribable, and but it's got Elvis, thing, and it's got a it? mummy, and it's a whole weird cornucopia collage of a whatever. Go, next. next. He's very sweaty in that movie, isn't he? Mm. Sorry. Like Maybe. And naked. <laughs> I don't know. From Chris <laughs> Riley on Facebook, My Favorite Year. Oh, oh come on. Bye. Buy it twice. Bye. It's, it's the best. It is, it is great. It is great. Peter O'Toole. <laughs> You know, this this um, model has been ripped off a lot. You know, the young acolyte and the the the, the older Kaiser. seasoned guy. His name is Kaiser. Yeah, uh, it's it's a little. You know, Ed Wood really kind of stole this a little bit, but uh, it's a great movie. Peter yeah. O'Toole is terrific. Yep, I love that movie. Yeah, I gotta. You know what? Actually, thank you for reminding me. I have to want to watch that, that again. I, agree. I haven't watched it in my a few mom, years. My mom's. That's my mom's favorite number. Oh, oh, yeah. oh yay, mom! Yay! yay. yay. Yes. Elaine's mom. By the way, Elaine's mom, buy it. What? Buy Elaine's mom? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it really wow, is. I don't know. I didn't know we got that personal on this show. Okay. I'm All right, little, lightning round, folks. I lightning feel, round. <laughs> lightning is striking I'm, in the, in feeling the garage uncomfortable. right now. From Michael Roche, or perhaps Roche, or Roche. It would be many. Roche. Okay. Well, As in Roche Bobois. I wonderful knew you were going to say that that stupid furniture store that sells $4,000 <laughs> chairs. <laughs> That's where you want to buy all the furniture for, your, for whatever you're going to derive. You want to buy a $4,000 chair. I, forget it. Let's move on. Michael Roche. He didn't even have a movie. Just wanted you to say his name. No, just kidding. <laughs> okay. Hook. What? what? Hook. I, I, you know what, I, I, I can't say burn to a Spielberg action thing that's basically fine but horribly flawed, one of his first uh, underachieving films, so I'll say Rent. Lightning round, go away, lightning round. I'm going to go with a Brent on that one. Oh, um, controversial. Let's agree to disagree. It's, it's, very, it's, uh, it, look, it's just, it gets terrible with the Lost Boys <laughs> and then Robin Williams with his unbelievably, unrealistically waxed chest. It just isn't realistic. 
Everyone oh, wait, knows. No, it. So it isn't real. A movie about a guy. With no, a book no, no, for no. A hand, what? No, the wax chest isn't realistic. Robin Williams. Not for him. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm saying Wrench. You're saying Brent. Brent. Okay. Here we go. Okay. From Stuart Moncure on Facebook. Stuart. You'll like this one too, yeah, Wade. Yeah, Stuart. La Cercle Rouge. La uh, Cercle yes. Rouge. Rouge. That's what I said. Yes, Le Cercle Rouge. Is that one of your favorite uh, films of... Ah, ah, ah. Rent. <laughs> I thought this Don't was a lighting rent. I know, I know. I'm, I'm going to go rent on that. Okay, I'll go... You I, know what? I'll go rent too. Okay. I haven't seen that in years, actually. Yeah, I... It, uh, I'm going to say rent. Is that a criterion? No, that's not a criterion. I was, that's what I was just thinking. I was thinking is it, if it did... Uh, it may be on criterion, but it's... I'm going to say rent. All right, Stuart, rent it and then email us at, uh, yeah. at uh, digigods. Yeah. At digigods.com. Let us know what you thought. Go. From Matthias in the chat room, yeah. and in keeping in today's alien theme, Mars Attacks. Oh, bye. Bye. You know, uh, you know. So bye. You know. So totally bye. Rent. Oh, my gosh. Rent. you got to buy a thing. Look, I, I'm you know sorry. What? Any movie that has Tom Jones in it is an automatic buy. <laughs> On top of that, it's really genuinely hysterically funny. You know, this film has a climax that nobody would believe if you didn't see it. It is so funny, it just slays you. I just didn't get it. You know it. the press screening for this? Our friend Ray Green yeah. at the press screening for this actually thought that the studio had planted a ringer in the audience because there was a guy three or four rows behind him who was howling so hysterically, Ray said, there's no way that person really finds this movie to be that funny. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it was not as outrageous as I thought it was. I, was I think in, there's a lot of stuff going on, but somehow I'm not laughing. I was in tears. I, just I was in tears. I, I was like laughing so okay. hard. The, 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 the lightning is striking very slowly yeah. this week. Go. <laughs> Next. This is from the chat room from BJJK. Yeah. Uh, I like to say, I don't know. <laughs> City Lights. Bye for crying out City loud. City Lights. Chaplain. Give me a break. City Lights. Bye. You know what I just rewatch is, because uh, I haven't seen it in so long, is, which, by the way, I streamed. <laughs> uh, Gold Rush. So good. Gold Rush is great. By Renner Burton, Gold Rush. Oh, uh, uh, stream it. Okay. By Renter Stream. By Renter Stream. Are you doing the Chaplin thing with the with the Well, with actually, the well, well, Gold Rush has two iconic moments. One is the roll dance, yeah. and the other is the thing where he eats the shoe. Yeah. That's right. He's, he, right. he treats but the shoe like City Lights by, by yeah, the way. Yeah, City yeah, Lights totally. friggin' by. Go. We're almost done. Can you feel the excitement? Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> Bye. From Furry Bender in the chat room, tenderness. What are you talking about, Willis? I'm trying to remember what tenderness is. I Director. think Russell Crowe was mentioned in the context. Tenderness of this is a film that Russell Crowe did recently yes. as a favor to the director. Wow. That's right. <laughs> there was no reason why he was supposed to star in that film other than he did it as a favor for the director. The film was not very good. I didn't see I it. I missed it. I didn't see it. I, I didn't see and it either. And the thing is, is it. that when I read the story of it, why Russell Crowe did this film? I remember the story, but I did not see the movie. I yeah. remember. I'm like, I, I, I'm going to pass on this. No, so uh, we're, we're just going to work. You know what? Green Hornet. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah! What if it's what great, though? <laughs> well, look, I mean, you know, let's at least see the graphic. <laughs> we said we didn't see it, so. Oh, yeah. yes! <laughs> great. <laughs> Fantastic. Excellent. All right, All right, next. We let's end on a on a winner. You say so. This is not the end, though. Oh. Oh well. No, more. <laughs> Would you like to end? Uh, and bring no, it on. Keep bring going. it on. We're loving it. We're almost there. I promise. Okay. All right. You'll know. From E Alvarez eighty eight, or as I like to say, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> train spotting. Oh, train oh. spotting. You wouldn't like train spotting. It's all about drugs, and I love drugs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, you gotta buy Charlie that. Sheen? Charlie Sheen? Do we, do we go? uh, exactly. Oh, you got. I know the past, but I'm doing yeah, it. Oh. Drugs. There we go. There we go. Um, oh, you gotta buy that. Boy, you know, I really struggle with train spotting. I have to be honest. It, it, if there's, is there something between buy and rent? Rent. That, rent. That's rent. Right. Okay. It's Brent. Let's agree uh, to disagree. Not burn and rent. Buy and rent. Well, it um, we sort of have an all-purpose Brent in this place. Yeah. I. Yeah. Lightning round. I know. <laughs> I, I struggle with train spotting. It's really well made, but it just it makes cue me the bad. struggling graphic. Kind of makes me ill at the same time. <laughs> that toilet. Say oh. something. Uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> Rent. Whatever it. Whatever Rent. it. Wonderful. <laughs> you'll you'll all be pleased to know that this is the last one. Okay, here we Yay. go. In keeping with today's alien theme, once again yes. and finally, from Sean Things in the chat room, fire in the sky. Interesting. 
Of all the ones he could have named, he names one that's like, okay. It's not bad. No. I'm sorry, he wrote Aliens. He, he, he wrote Aliens. <laughs> he did not. <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> uh, I rent. I say, buy Aliens. <laughs> rent Fire in the Sky. Yeah, it's okay. I guess. It's fine. That's not a winner. Someone, may, someone name another film and we'll just say we love it and then we'll cue the graphic. Battery's not included. Oh, oh Battery's Billy not Dean. included with the asterisk at the, on the poster. Asterisk in the chat room, too. He was right on top of it. Is that right? Yes. Billy yeah. Dean. Well that's done. a rent. That's a rent. I, I, I'm inclined to say that's a burn. That, that that's was, like an early Amblin film. Yeah, it, was, it was at a point where Steven Spielberg's name on a movie just felt really whorish. Well, that was when Amblin was really pretty. Well, it was like, it was like up. there were these Spielberg movies that he directed, and then there were movies he produced, and then suddenly there are just tons of knockoff Spielberg movies made by no-name people. They just happen to have aliens and robots and kids in them. And uh, it was like <laughs> Steven Spielberg Presents, and they were just they, they were hopeless. And that was one of them. It's like, really? Now everything with aliens and robots and kids is a Spielberg movie? <laughs> oh, we got an applause. Yeah, All right, like, so I guess wow, we say Rents about it. not included. the whole included. concept, so I'm going to say Burn. Oh, you're I, mean. I already handed him out. Yeah, oh. thank you. So is that it? That's, is that it for this week's? Oh, buy rent or burn. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're done. Go to sleep. You may go to sleep now. Wow. When I point to Wade, that means Wade speaks. Yeah, like I got an eye right here. <laughs> All right, so uh, so there you go, like folks. What have, wait, what have we learned? Not much, really, <laughs> honestly. Why should this show be any different from any other? Not much. Uh, we've so, learned that Battle LA is very loud. Yeah, we've learned that we've learned that. If you see a pot-smoking alien hanging around on the side of the road and cursing, pick him up. He will make your life so much better. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, by the way, before we go, we have to thank, uh, obviously, the crew every week. But Corey Levin, the substitute producer, what a job. Cut to Corey's camera. Take a bow, Corey Levin. Wait, let me give you your thing. <laughs> give me my thing. Yeah. Son of a... I love it. Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, Corey, thank you. Crew, thank you. Wade, uh, well, I don't know what you do. Well, good night, everyone. <laughs>